Databases. A database seminar series at Carnegie Mellon University is recorded in front of a live studio audience. Funding for this program is made possible by Ottertune. Google. We're super happy today to have Jordan Dirk Uh He is the co founder and designer of Tiger Beetle which is a new transaction processing database system written in ZIG, which is a major point of, of this talk that I'll talk about today. Um, so he's here to talk, talk about Tiger Beetle. And so I'm excited because it's always, it's super hard to build a transaction processing system and he's gonna try to do it and try to convince you why his is really good. So uh, as always, if you have any questions for uh, Jordan while he's giving the talk, please unmute yourself, there you are, and feel free to do this anytime. That way it's a conversation for him and not talking for himself for an hour. Um, and with that, Jordan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here. I will say you're in South Africa right now and it's 11.30 p.m. So we appreciate you staying up late. Uh, awesome, thanks Andy. Uh, it's a good day tonight. night. Uh, incredible, incredible to be with you all. And I look forward to our discussion questions as we take a tour of Tiger Beetle. Uh, Tiger Beetle is a distributed database, open source Apache 2, uh, designed to count anything at scale. Uh, for example, financial transactions, in-app purchases, API billing, rate limiting, even game scores, page views or likes. Uh, so any kind of balance or business event really and any kind of count uh, where there's a vector or some quantity of value uh, that's moving between two or more parties so to do this uh, tiger beetle gives you double entry accounting primitives out of the box and a single binary that you can run to have a highly available cluster with mission critical safety strict serializability and performance uh, with a tightly scoped domain uh, we've gone deep on the technology to do new things with the whole design of Tiger Beetle, our global consensus protocol, local storage engine, the way we work with the network disk and memory, the testing techniques we use, and the guarantees that Tiger Beetle gives the operator. Uh, for example, uh, one of the most surprising is that there is no dynamic allocation of memory during runtime. So after startup, uh, we don't call malloc or free. I instead, we make the technology exciting. Uh, so that deploying Tiger Beetle can be as boring as Tetris with square boxes. So I promise you some surprises, uh, some treasures are new and old. Uh, in fact, we wrote a blog post about Tiger Beetle's static allocation. Uh, and I loved the fun hacking news comment that said, welcome back to the 70s. And to which I reply, it's good to be back. So uh, let's roll up for the magical memory tour, uh, because so many design decisions in Tiger Beetle have to do with how we work with memory. Um, how we think about memory explains questions like, why scale up before scale out? Why use direct IO to skip the kernel page cache? Why use cache line aligned fixed size data structures? Why write a new storage engine instead of RocksDB or LevelDB? Why is IOU ring so exciting? Uh, why decouple database performance from memory allocation? And my favorite, why Zig? So Andy, are you ready? Go for it. Uh, look, you pay whatever copyright thing you violate here. It's all you. I just figured I'll ask you the question first, and then we get to, to get the Q&A going back and, back and forward. So, yeah, so let's cross the road because our first stop is why design a ledger database? And the short answer is that uh, double entry accounting at scale uh, can be a killer workload. It's a hard problem for a number of reasons. Uh, first, you can't sacrifice anything. As engineers, we like trade-offs. Uh, sometimes you can trade latency for throughput or strict serializability for availability. But when you're tracking something as valuable as account balances, you have to have both strict serializability and high availability, and you have to have both high throughput and low latency. So if you have a big business or if your business has strict SLAs, there's nowhere to hide. Uh, you need mission critical safety and performance. Uh, you want the system to be as easy to operate. Uh, to be predictable and to just work. The second reason is less obvious uh, in that the nature of double entry is contention. If you have a million customers, but one bank account, then you have a million debits to different customer accounts, but all million debits must still credit the same bank account. So um, this interacts badly with Rolox. So you pe see uh, people reaching for sharding, but with double entry, sharding across rows of databases is a showstopper. Uh, because then you can't easily execute global transfers across accounts, at least not with predictable performance and critical business logic becomes complicated. So you also might not have enough accounts for sharding to make a difference. Uh, for example, for a high volume payment switch, only three to four banks participating, you might find even a single account 
approaching the limits of an ad hoc solution. So finally, the hardest part is that you're not only tracking money movements within a system, you're often also tracking money movements between systems with different stacks. You're in the world of distributed systems, doing two-phase commit across ledgers. Now you have four balances, debits and credits, pending and posted, uh, to control liquidity for in-flight transactions as money moves between ledgers. Uh, but to get in-flight transactions right, your distributed database has to be able to deal with subtle issues like your clock sync protocol getting asymmetrically partitioned. So this is where the clock sync partitions are not aligned with your consensus protocol. So clock sync is broken, but your consensus is running. And then there's the risk that your transactions get timestamped too far into the future, causing money to be locked up. So getting these primitives right to track transfers within and between systems is not easy. Uh, the story goes like this. Uh, you start with a tried and tested SQL database. Uh, it can do hundreds of thousands of trans transactions per second as raw material. Uh, then you write your ledger logic in the application around this. Uh, but when you look at the finished product and how long it took you to build it, uh, you're spending a few thousand dollars a month on hardware only to hit the wall at 100 transactions per second, or if you're lucky, 1,000. Now you've got 10,000 lines of code around your SQL core, and your financial invariants are no longer enforced or protected by the database. So you're building a ledger database, but you don't know it. And for bonus points, uh, there's no Jepson report. On top of this, uh, the world is becoming more transactional. Uh, we've already seen the cloud moving from hourly to per second billing. Now APIs need to do usage tracking. Games are doing more in-app transactions. Even energy providers are starting to switch energy back and forth um, into the grid more and more frequently to arbitrage energy prices. The faster you can settle, the more, um, the more you can serve people, the more money you can make. So volume is increasing across sectors, and it's a hard problem getting harder. How do you solve a problem like this? Uh, we wanted a methodology. We asked ourselves two questions. First, uh, what design will serve our three goals of safety, performance, and pred predictability or operator experience? Um, second, how can we develop the design in a tenth of the time, in other words, velocity? So in terms of design goals, uh, for a new distributed database to make sense, it's quite a big investment. We wanted to increase performance by three orders of magnitude uh, with 10 times less hardware and 10 times more safety. Uh, we wanted Tiger Beetle to be so safe uh, that developers start to feel nervous if they're using anything else. So we defined clear fault models for network storage memory CPU. Uh, crucially, we also adapted, uh, adopted NASA's Power of 10 Rules for Safety Critical Code by Gerard Holtzman. And the result is that we now have more than 3,000 assertions in Tiger Beetle uh, to ensure that everything either runs correctly or shuts down safely. Based on experience with assertions over the last seven years, even before Tiger Beetle, I've come to see that fail fast, fail safe, is a good philosophy to have. And it also makes particular sense for a distributed database like Tiger Beetle, where assertions can help you detect deadlock in production while at the same time protecting you from them, since after the replica restarts, it probably won't hit that rare case again. So your system self heals and you learn from it, and then it gets better for everybody else using it uh, instead of letting these kinds of bugs lie latent and dormant. So in terms of design, we looked at different architectures. We're pretty lucky here uh, because right about the same time, two years ago, July 2020, when we started Tiger Beetle, Martin Thompson of LMAX was speaking about the state of the art in the evolution of financial exchange ar architectures and the value of seeing these as replicated state machines. Uh, so an easy way to understand what a replicated state machine is, is to say it backwards. Uh, very loosely speaking, it's a machine with some state uh, that you replicate through a log. If you replay the log operations in order through the state machine function, which is really a pure function that takes the current state plus the new operation, applies the new operation to the old state, and then returns the new state. And if you do this across all machines in the cluster, then all machines reach the same state. But how do you take this architecture and solve for a performance? How do you design a ledger to be a thousand times faster than ad hoc ledgers? And how do you do this on commodity hardware for a tenth of the price? So it's worth motivating that this is important as a goal uh, because performance is a spectrum you can trade. Performance gives you a margin of safety to cope with growth and avoid high utilization because that's where little slow kicks in and where latencies start to skyrocket. Um, you also don't have to cut corners. Uh, for example, in some parts of the world, high throughput ledgers can only keep up 
by running in volatile memory. If the power goes, the transactions are all lost and have to be recovered from banking partners. So you phone a friend. Uh, but if you have a thousand times more performance in your ledger, uh, then you can take uh, the heat and trade this performance for stable storage and a safer system. So performance also buys you cost efficiency. Uh, this is surprising, uh, but you can have a smaller hardware footprint and start to survive in challenging environments. For example, a friend of ours benchmarked Tiger Beetle achieving 94,000 transactions per second on a Raspberry Pi on an SD card. And what I love about the particular SD card they used, and I looked it up, um, is that it's advertised as having superior write speeds of up to 30 megabytes a second. And I didn't see what the asterisk was for. Um, and that it's also waterproof, temperature proof, and X-ray proof. Uh, so the motivation for performance is cool stuff like this, you know, to be fast on small, slow hardware. Um, and how do you do this for a replicated state machine? Uh, the answer is mechanical sympathy. Uh, there are four parts to this. Uh, it's the four physical resources of a computer, uh, network, disk, memory, CPU. Uh, these four resources have two characteristics in common, latency and bandwidth. And I think the best way to make the CPU go fast is just to think about memory. Uh, the best way to think about memory is to think about disk. The best way to think about disk is to think about network. So let's work our way up to disk and memory, starting with the network. And here, in terms of network, uh, when we looked around at existing ledgers, they were built around SQL databases with no double entry primitives. So what we saw is that for every financial transaction, the application would make around 10 to 20 physical SQL queries for every one logical financial transaction. We actually looked at an open source payment switch. We did consulting work. We traced all the SQL. And it, it's pretty tough to optimize. You know, it sounds like a lot of queries, but it, it kind of needed to make that many. It was about 18. Uh, so if you're good, you can, you can really get this down to like one physical SQL query per logical financial transaction. Or of course, you can even put push past um, lots of stuff you can do. Uh, but then you start to run into the problem of contention, as we saw before, where Relox block updates to, to, uh, to hard accounts. So we therefore ask the question, how can we go from one database query per financial transaction to one database query per 10,000 financial transactions. Uh, because if you can do that, you've not only made the system a thousand times faster, but also 10 times cheaper. So we call this the payments equation. And what we did uh, with Tiger Beetle was to change the way that the application talks to the database. It's a simple idea. Uh, instead of the client sending one financial transaction in a single database query, you send on the order of 10,000 transactions in a single database query. So a single database query and you've done 10,000, another database query and you've done another 10,000. And you can do this because financial transactions are small. They're an ID, a data description, an ID of the debit and credit accounts, the account being moved. Uh, if you leave room for user data um, to link up to external sidecar databases, uh, you can think of a financial transaction as uh, two CPU cache lines or 128 bytes, or if you're using an Apple M1, it's just one cache line. Uh, so we're future-proof, uh, but you can pack 10,000 of these transactions together uh, into about a meg and send them over the network to the database. Uh, database can write this to the disk. Disk networks really like it. Uh, if you give them bigger pieces of work to do, uh, you get more throughput. Uh, and counterintuitively, you also get better latency because your system doesn't build up queues. So it's like the Eiffel Tower. If you only allow one person in the elevator at a time, then people are going to queue outside the ticket office. Uh, but if your elevator can accommodate like 10 people, it makes sense. You know, let's let those 10 people in at a time to enjoy the view. So we prototyped this design back in July 2020, uh, sketched all the performance components over like a five hour, um, five hour session, Sunday afternoon. Uh, and after five hours, we realized we could achieve on the order of a million transactions per second on a single CPU core uh, with scale up before scale out. So kind of like the Frank McSherry paper, you know, scalability, but at what cost? Single core systems, if you design them right, work with the memory well, they're, they're really, really muscular. Uh, so batching of client requests was the big one. Uh, everything is a batch, and it's just a question of whether it's a batch of one or a batch of 10,000. So this kind of changed the way I see interfaces today. Now I see everything as a batch. You know, if you're doing consensus, it's a batch. 
just the question is, is it a batch of one or 10,000? And this idea I think is really powerful. You know, if you're designing systems, just make your interface support an array of stuff. That way you can always just put one thing in, but if you've got more, it just works better with the hardware. Um, but how do you do state machine replication within the cluster? We've sort of solved the problem of how you get the transactions from the client to the database. How do you now replicate within the cluster? How do you ensure that all machines in the cluster have a totally ordered log that you can run through your state machine? So here, we didn't just want to assume Raft you know, on the basis that it's popular, like Raft. Uh, <laughs> instead, we looked around uh, and we reached for Brian Oakey, Barbara Liskop, James Carling's view stamp replication or VSR. Um, if you know Raft, uh, then Raft is in fact, um, I was saying to Andy earlier, it's like a grandchild of VSR. It's a descendant, it's, it's in the lineage. It's a, a subset of VSR, except that Raft has a leader election of view change algorithm that is random and it dates back to Paxos, which is unfortunate. Um, however, the 20, and, and we'll go into the reason why, but uh, the 2012 revision of VSR's view, view change algorithm is newer. Um, it was written two years before Raft, but Raft kind of missed it. So Raft went with like the random view change of 88 or 89 VSR Paxos. Uh, and 2012 was already like an, another iteration by Barbara Liskop, James Cowling. Uh, it's not in Raft, but VSR has got it. It's this view change that encodes more information into the protocol. So you get more predictability. And the big thing is that this means you don't have Raft's problem of dueling leaders. So there's also no randomized padding to mitigate this as you would have in Raft. Um, so you get faster fault detection and faster fault isolation with VSR. If the leader fails, you detect it quicker. Uh, you can also switch over to the next leader in you know, a few tens of milliseconds quicker. So if you care about latency, um, it's it's a better view change. Um, it's it's better for distributed systems. I did an interview with James Cowling. Uh, he just gave some fantastic explanations, everything they were thinking that just went into this view change. Uh, so it's really worth it. Um, again, um, you don't have Raft's problem of tuning leaders, so there's no risk that you'll get stuck in another leader election loop, which can happen with Raft. So now uh, with the concept of a replicated state machine with VSR as our champion replication and consensus protocol, uh, we have a global consensus protocol for replicated log. Um, and we have a local storage engine, uh, which we'll look at a bit later. Uh, the local storage engine obviously is to store the state uh, that the state machine produces um, as we run operations through the state machine function. So at this point, we're pretty far along uh, with a design, still got a code, right? Uh, but we have strict serializability, high availability, thanks to VSR. Uh, but you have to be careful with all these things to think of the network not only in terms of latency, which you see so often even in distances, you have to also think in terms of bandwidth. Um, so you see sometimes, you know, papers are always talking about star topology for replication. That's where the leader replicates in parallel to all the followers. But this divides your available bandwidth throughput by the number of followers at the leader. So for example, just a, a small one gigabit NIC at the leader with four followers, if you use a star topology, then you can only do 250,000 transfers per second. Obviously, million transfers is 128 megs. Um, so that's your, yeah, your million divided by four there is 250. Um, so you've also quadrupled your leader's load and you've made your network load unbalanced. Um, you know, the leader is doing far more work and this increases the risk of cascading failures. So here instead, what, what we use is what we call a Ringo star topology. Uh, for real, right? This is where we arrange the cluster machines or replicas in a ring. Um, the leader replicates to the next machine and so on. And then each machine sends a small act reply directly back to the leader. So there's no RPC here. This is like full on message passing. Um, the leader can send to any machine at once. It doesn't expect a reply. They then send a separate message back. So you get these really interesting, you know, routing um, topology where you can do multi-path routing. It's really pretty cool. Like it's, it's and that, that's also interesting with Raft VSR. If you look at the papers closely, you'll see Raft assumes, you know, request response like HTTP. That that actually isn't great, I think, you know, with consensus. VSR is, is full on message passing, which is a little bit broader. The terms are very similar, obviously, but VSR just guides you. Uh, this is how we got it for Tiger Beetle. So again, this is kind of like chain replication, which is great for throughput. Uh, but then for latency to handle partitions or machine failures when the ring is broken, 
you obviously want to blend this a little bit with star topology. So you retransmit to other machines, either proactively or reactively. Uh, lots of techniques you can use. So what's great with VSR here is that you can also predict who the next leader is going to be. It's not a random view change. Uh, so with VSR, you can have your current leader prioritize synchronous replication. Obviously, you're not you're replicating to all the replicas in the cluster, but your replication, some of it must be synchronous for durability guarantees. Some of it doesn't have to be synchronous. It can be async. Um, so what you do then is you take VSR, you say, right, I know who the next user is going to be. They need to have you know, everything. So prioritize synchronous replication to the next predicted leader, and then you can do async replication to the others. So this gives you the durability you need, the machines you need it on most uh, before you reply back to the client. But what was also... Yeah. How much how is intelligence? I mean, how much intelligence is, do you have in topology? Or are you just going around the ring? Meaning, like, like if I know another box is, is on a different switch and there's three other boxes on that switch with it, can I just send a message to that the leader within that box and then it replicates locally? Are you, are you doing anything like that, or is everyone treated as a first class citizen? We we don't have that yet, but we've been thinking about it because what's pretty interesting is as an operator, if you know that replication is just following the ring. You know, you, you 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 provision your cluster replica zero, one, two, three, four. They're they're ordered like that. You can actually just lay your replicas out to match your physical network topology. That would make the most sense, you know, for replication. Um, but we're gonna those those are features we want to do that um, that would be pretty cool just to try and play with this more. Uh, we've also got some things where we doing like a little bit of gossip and getting more awareness of you know faults in the network so that. If you see ring isn't going to work, you switch to star. Um, I was say, this reminds me of NuDB had a similar gossip protocol. I was going to say this. It did sort of something like this for the, I think they call it their transaction executors, where like you know someone has a cache or something and you do an update, you, you can validate it. I mean, th this is a shared nothing system, right? Um, uh, so like, oh, shared everything. Yeah. It it, it, yeah, it's, I mean, the state is fully replicated, but the actual, we, we don't gossip, you know, the actual in-memory, you know, control plane stuff on each replica that that they, ha they have their own view of the network. We're not doing like full-on gossip with the, with that, that. Is that what you mean, Andy? No, no, it's more like if you do an update on the front-end node, it could then do did a gossip protocol to, to, to broadcast the update to a, to, a, to a logical record to other nodes. You're, you're yeah. doing you're doing two replications. You're going in a ring. Theirs was yeah. more of a like, scatter kind of thing. Um, yeah. And then just to reiterate, like it's a shared everything system where every node has a complete copy of the data. You're just making multiple copies. Yes. Uh, absolutely. We we we're definitely replicating all the data to every node. Uh, and then it's just a question of how do you do that efficiently? Because if the leader gets it to every machine, it you know, um, mm -hmm. there there was a paper that came out. Oh, I've forgotten the name, but it was it was um, Michael. But it was basically the idea of trying to, you know, how do you share the load of the leader and let's introduce proxies that can do the re replication, but it's a lot of the same thing, it's just different ways to do it. But I really like chain replication. It's a fantastic technique. And here, the only problem is chain replication is enough consensus. You have to manually, when the topology breaks, you know, reconfigure the ring. Here, you just integrate it with consensus and you get high throughput, plus you can, you know, fix up your topology um, and, and however you like, it's pretty easy. Um, yeah, so we obviously this is still work in progress, but these are these are the ideas. Uh, uh, the the ring is there for sure, and the retry retransmit is there, um, and and also what was important on the networking side here is just the philosophy that network events from remote machines shouldn't be able to trigger memory allocations in TigerView. Like if someone sends you a message, it it cannot cause a memory allocation. I, I think that idea is pretty foreign to people, but I think it's so important. You can't, how do you build a safe, secure system if someone can just poke you and your database is going to allocate? You know, so we, we with Tiger Beetle, we wanted to totally de decouple ourselves from external stimuli. So we're going to get into that now. Uh, we, we, yeah, we wanted to decouple performance from memory allocation. So as your performance increases, resource usage must stay the same. I have a question um, with, about draft, if it's okay to interrupt. Sure. Okay. Uh, I don't know about uh, view stamp replication, uh, but I'll definitely check it out uh, on Raft. Uh, so uh, the reason, so what I understood from Ringo Star topology is that leader uh, does send uh, messages to 
followers to begin the replication process, but also followers send uh, the messages to other followers. So it's not yes. just the leader sending messages. I, from what I understand, Raft, uh, the Raft leader, only the leader is sending messages because the leader log becomes the source of truth. So if the leader is getting some transaction, it is the algorithm is so, such that this. Um, yeah, so how are uh, you solving that? So uh, we, we'll, for example, we'll, we'll get to that. I've got a, I've actually got a diagram where we show exactly, you know, the difference between Raft's leader, you know, who, 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 which log do you trust, you know? Um, but the, 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 easy, the easy answer is just that Raft really is VSR. So all, yeah. all these techniques, you, you can do them with Raft. Um, you have to maybe like mess, you know, you have to, De, you know, rip out that RPC and and get to like a proper message bus, which is which would make Raft better, I think. Um, but you, you, but you, there's no, it, do, it doesn't change any of the correctness. Raft is VSR, like the the whole correctness proof comes from. Well, I mean, I mean the, the algorithm, you know, is is Brian Oakey's VSR. Um, it's just okay. the only the only the unique thing with Raft is really like the paper presentation, the RPC, you know, everything in a single table. Um, plus the view change just comes from Paxos. It's random. Um, that's I, that's. I mean, I'm just being very reductionist, but I think those are roughly right. You know? I would say also too, like a bunch of people made wrap implementations in a bunch of different programming languages. Like there was never any lib Paxos, right? Where there's a bunch of wrap implementations. I think that, but that was led to the the, the wider adoption of wrap over Paxos. Yes, yes, exactly. And Raft is great. I mean, because VSR is great. So if you love Raft, it's really VSR that you like. It's just that we don't know this is the lineage. We get it from from Brian Oakey. You know, he he pioneered consensus a year ahead of Paxos, and it was all there. It just it just needed Raft to come along and repackage it in a in a paper that we could appreciate. Uh, I just wish you know that that more people knew about Brian. <laughs> yeah, so. Another question: Does Raft really wait for uh, like when? So I was under. I was. I thought that Raft can send messages and do not have does not have to wait for responses from the followers. Yeah, quite right. E e either way, you know, you it, it that also works. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Thank you. And that's that's the thing with all these things is like you'll see with Tiger Beetle with what we you know with what we do. So VSR is obviously the view change, um, and it's just because that's the historical name for this mm -hmm. thing. That's that's why we call it VSR, you know. Uh, but but I mean, we then take protocol aware recovery for consensus based storage. We take the control protocol from there. We also implement that, and I'm, I'm going to show you that just now. So what what you see as Tiger Beetle's VSR is a whole lot of stuff. Um, and, and that's the thing with Raft, you know, you can take Raft and then take a whole lot of papers to, to mix up how you do reconfigurations. Oh, and same with Paxos, it's all into like multi-Paxos, multi-Paxos Raft PSR, they're all, you can, like Heidi Howard has a great paper showing how you can just mix and match, learn from all these systems. So we, we take Heidi Howard's flexi flexible Paxos quorums and we just apply them to PSR because it's really the same it's the same problem, you know, distributed consensus. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, but again, we just wanted to de decouple all this um, and the performance from allocations so that memory usage is constant regardless of throughput. So it's like C groups, uh, but in your database, uh, as the operator, you tell Tiger Beetle how much memory it can use, and that's what it will use. So this keeps the operator in the database uh, in control, means that Tiger Beetle has a limit on all network resources to safely handle overload. Uh, also thinking about networking in terms of memory, uh, because network bandwidth is starting to overtake per core memory bandwidth. So often you'll get like these DIMMs and they advertise, I don't know, like uh, 20,000 whatever gigabytes a second or 20 gigabytes a second, right? Uh, but per core CPU memory bandwidth is actually closer to around six gigabytes a second or about 20 for M1. Uh, so if, if like on most Linux machines, you're dealing with six, there's a lot of um, networks that are faster than that. Uh, so we were really careful to reduce memory copies. Um, so we receive uh, from the kernel's TCP receive buffer into one of our statically allocated buffers. Um, and then because the Tiger Beetle client has already done the work of arranging the data in the buffer carefully, it's almost ready to append as is to the log. 
So we've thought, thought through all this stuff so that like really try and minimize mem copies. Um, all we have to do at the leader is literally just tweak the 128 byte header that's in the buffer. And then the leader has to recheck some of the buffer. Obviously that's now kind of akin to a mem copy, but there are no further copies beyond this. Uh, so you can take a look at the on request method. It's on underscore request. Um, and you'll see that in Tiger Beetle source VSR replica.sig. You can see this in action and actually read through the whole VSR protocol, everything I've, I've we've been speaking about. Uh, so let's move, uh, move on, uh, network to disk. Um, yeah, what's nice with the larger batch size that we use for networking is that it also plays better with the disk for sequential write throughput. So you can amortize F-Sync. You can amortize F-Sync across thousands of requests for very efficient group commit. It's like group commit on steroids, uh, but the database doesn't have to do, it doesn't have to have any mem copy overhead to construct the group um, since this work is offloaded to the client. So you literally, you call receive to the kernel, you enter a statically allocated buffer and there's your group commit done. Um, obviously these clients are API gateways. So they, they're big enough getting enough volumes that they can batch for you. Um, at the same time, uh, when we write to disk or read from disk, we also use direct IO. Uh, and I, I really love direct IO. I know Linus doesn't. Uh, I love his rants about it, but I love direct IO and I always have. Uh, it's crucial for performance. Um, you have to avoid that expensive mem copy to, to or from the kernel's page cache. Um, even more so for safety, you just can't build a safe database today um, without it because the kernel's page cache uh, can swallow IO errors and rep report uh, dirty pages as clean in what has become, become known as the infamous uh, F-Sync gate. So as far as we know, direct IO is really the only way to handle this correctly. Um, but if your page cache is managed by the database now, it's also really cool uh, because you can get huge speed ups by avoiding a copy completely whenever you hit the cache, especially if this is like a cache for LSM tree, you know, where you're doing lots of read amplification. If you were going to kernel page cache, you're doing copies across all the, the levels in your tree. Now, if you own your page cache, which is awesome if you're a database, um, you can then change your cache interface to allow synchronous functions. If you know they're just gonna work on the data synchronously, it's pretty safe. You can give them a constant read only page pointer instead of doing a page copy. Uh, so at one point I actually worked out how much throughput we would have lost if we hadn't done this for Tiger Beetle. And it was something so scary that I won't repeat here. Uh, but this is why, as you know, as far as I understand, it's so important to avoid mem copies uh, because otherwise every time you do a copy, it's not just the cost of the copy itself for the CPU. This is just why I think it's important, you know, to avoid copies because you've got the costs of the copy for the CPU itself, but then you're also potentially flushing parts of the CPU's L1, L2 caches, uh, and that de-optimizes other parts of your system. So database memory bandwidth across the whole system is really important. Uh, but I think, you know, how we see and work with the disk from a safety perspective is where Tiger Beetle really starts to diverge from most databases. So while we use many of the same performance techniques, what I've showed you is nothing new. Um, we have a stricter storage fault model. And this is because most databases are not designed really to survive bit rot, misdirected reads or writes or latent sector errors. Um, so you see checksums, but that's really because power loss and torn writes are about as far as must go. Uh, so there's some checksumming, but not as much testing. Um, so I thought we can look at a few examples of storage faults, you know, what I mean, uh, starting with the easiest. So let's try this out, right? Bit rot sounds simple. You just use checksums, right? Everybody agree? Okay, so there's a classic quote from Jeff Bonwick of ZFS about checksums. A block level checksum only proves that a block is self consistent. It doesn't prove that it's the right block. Reprising our UPS analogy, we guarantee that the package you received is not damaged. We do not guarantee that it's your package. Um, however, I mean, that's misdirected rights, which is pretty, that, that's pretty nasty when that happens, also pretty rare. But much worse is this research from UW Madison, one best paper at FAST18. And it showed that many distributed databases have latent correctness bugs in their right ahead log. So I've chatted with engineers about this. Um, and I always ask them this question. I say, oh, okay, so what happens? So I'm going to show you the example now. 
Um, uh, this is really like a latent correctness bug in the right ahead log for, I don't know, just name a database. Um, and it's even with respect to very simple single sector faults. It's not even misdirected IO as in a bond with quote, right? Uh, so the trouble is that they always interpret a checksum failure in any portion of the right ahead log as a torn right after power loss. And then they truncate the log from that point on. So the database starts up, it reads in its right ahead log, sees a checksum failure, it goes, aha, like that was, that was a torn right, that was power loss, right? And then truncate the rest of the log. Foundation DB goes even further because it knows sometimes this is torn right, but sometimes there's what looks like a valid entry further. So foundation will even zero the rest of the log. It's, it, they found correctness bugs like that, which is pretty cool. We've got that in Tiger Beetle too. Um, but, but, but still the, the issue is that, you know, you see a, a checksum mismatch and in, in the right ahead log, database is going to truncate the rest of the log. So we, I think we're all good on that point. I think you can see now the problem. Um, disks fail and, you know, they can flip bits in a single sector, regardless of, you know, your database is still running. Then it, the operator just shuts it down safely or good. You start it up again. Um, but it's possible for this kind of bit rot to occur in the committed portion of the right ahead log after the transaction was already act by the whole cluster. So in this case, most databases would confuse this with power loss again, and they're going to truncate even the committed transactions from that point on, which is really undermining your consensus quorum. So you can this can then propagate through the consensus protocol, and this can cause global cluster data loss. So if you want to read all about this protocol-aware recovery for consensus-based storage, it's kind of like one of those silent, slow-moving, like Bob Dylan said, you know, slow train coming. This paper, it won Best Paper Fast 2018, but it's still picking up. It's going to be maybe 10 years, and then then, <laughs> then everybody is panic stations, you know? Um, but you, you read the paper the first time, and, it, and it's like, ah, oh, okay. And you read it the second time, and you start to see, like, this is a real disaster. And there's so much other great stuff in there so, uh, that we're not touching on here. But this is something that's kind of, you have to change the whole database, how you design your right ahead log if you want to fix this. Um, so we, we follow the paper in this regard, uh, and we store headers for batches in our right ahead log out of band. Um, we have all the batches in one right ahead log. This is the actual like operation data. It's also got the header in each batch. Then we take all those little headers and we've got a small little right ahead log just for, for headers. And this enables Tiger Beetle to differentiate between torn right through power loss and bit rot in the middle of the committed log. Uh, there's also a lot more that we do for this. So we, we kind of took the idea with our whole storage fault model, multiplied it out. And the code for this that DJ wrote uh, is something that we're like super excited about. So we literally used a matrix uh, to enumerate all possible combinations of storage faults against our log recovery logic to then represent these cases in code and use compile time verification to check that all cases are handled. So this was going beyond the paper, like I said, and DJ and I spent a ton of calls and correspondence on this. Uh, we call these our walk and talks, you know, walk, walking, walking and talking through all kinds of failure scenarios. Uh, so since we're looking at repair faults in the right ahead log here, and this is coming back to the earlier uh, question, um, another issue with Raft is something like the RAID 5 problem, where a leader can only be elected, you know, according to Raft, if it has a pristine log. So Raft has this trick that it's gonna, it's only gonna elect someone who has the longest log. Uh, but it, it sounds great. Uh, it's not great in practice if you have a storage fault model um, because there are cases then where you, you're you not, you know, your cluster can become unavailable prematurely uh, because Raft has no protocol to repair the leader's log. It always trusts the leader's log and the followers catch up from that. But what do you do if everybody, you know, just like RAID 5 issue, you have a cluster of three and maybe one node is down and two replicas have two sector faults, well, then your cluster is down. So for example, in this diagram, a raft, here the black boxes are, are empty holes in the log. We've got three replicas. Um, and here a raft won't be able to elect a leader, the cluster will remain unavailable, even though there's enough durability for every operation. You can see here, every operation, the quorum intersection property is holding. You've got two out of three, two out of three. Um, so Tiger Beetle here can elect a new leader, even if the new leader has a faulty log. 
this is what we get from protocol aware recovery. It's that control protocol. Um, all you need is for each operation to have enough quorum across logs and the quorum doesn't need to always include the leader. So this means that with Tiger Beetle you, or with the control protocol, you get higher availability because you're fully utilizing the durability you're paying for. Uh, and I ju just think it's important, you know, that we, it, it's it's not a big change, you know. I mean, I mean, it's a bit of work, but we should be doing this um, because you've got the durability in the protocol. Um, so to give another storage fault example, uh, latent sector errors. This is where you periodically can't read sectors. Um, maybe you can't write them. Usually it's because you can't read them because uh, the disk might remap You know, if you can't write. But these are interesting for two reasons. Uh, first, they're not so rare. So a study by Bara Vasundaram, analysis of latent sector errors in disk drives, found that 3.4% of disks exhibit LSEs in a 32 month period. Um, the second reason is because they make the disk look like the network. Um, so these LSEs, you know, you temporarily can't read a sector. Suddenly it's like the network fault model, right? Um, where you might be temporarily partitioned from disk sectors. And this means that to work with the disk properly, you really need to see the disk as a distributed system. That's just one disk. I mean, this is like super theoretical stuff, right? But if you are designing like, critical file systems, then it makes sense to, to just do this right because these LSEs happen. Um, and yeah, just one of these, you might not be reading your disk correctly at startup. And um, this is especially true for copy on write file systems. You know, you've got copy on write trees, they've got root nodes and you atomically switch out the root node to move everything to a new tree. If you get an LSE, you might not see that new root, root uh, node and your file system might start up, you know, on an old state. And then, um, yeah, so that's why it's so important. You, you actually have to use consensus quorums, you know, read write quorums um, as you switch in your, I'll show you a diagram now what it looks like. So here you've got two trees, copy and write. The little block in the top right of the square is the root sector. You know, some file systems call this uber block or super block. So you've got all your copies. And then finally, when you're ready to commit them atomically, your whole file system state, you write your new, super block or you know your root sector um, and usually what file systems do is they'll write a few copies of this for durability because it's such a critical sector then at startup they'll look at all the well-known locations for these root sectors they'll literally just pick you know the sector with the highest sequence or version number and i think you can see where we're going um, because if you don't use quorums for this how do you know that you've read all the sectors you're supposed to uh, you can't just ignore one that you couldn't read because that might be the you know the latest version. So you have to have some guarantee that you're reading enough root sectors, that your read quorum intersects with the write quorum when the trees were switched out. Otherwise, you might temporarily see an old version of the trees, the newest. Um, again, you know, if some newer root sectors are temporarily partitioned through LSE. So to understand this better and actually see the code, you know, with how we solve this with Tiger Beetle Superblock, really nice. It's like quite fun code, you know. Uh, you can take a look at Tiger Beetle source for yourself, superblock.zig. Um, but of course, it's not enough to have a write ahead log. If your state is larger than memory, then you can't keep everything in memory. You need to page your state to disk and also page it in when you read it, um, when you need it. Uh, so you need a storage engine. Uh, and as with our consensus, I think you can guess what we did. But for Tiger Beetle, we wrote our own storage engine. Um, we had good reasons. Uh, so top five reasons uh, we wanted to solve our storage fault model. The existing engines didn't. Uh, second was we wanted to integrate the write ahead log of the storage engine with that of the replication protocol so that we could solve for, again, that example I showed you, you know, protocol aware recovery for consensus based storage. Um, you have to integrate your global consensus protocol with local storage engine if you want to do you have proper distributed database correctness? Um, third reason was we wanted to guarantee de deterministic storage. And that's for, you know, deterministic storage means you can do deterministic simulation testing, which is quite huge. We'll cover that later. But you can also do byte for byte verification across replicas that they reach the same state. This is like online verification for production systems, just giving you peace of mind that all the replicas you know, are, are an exact copy of the whole state, stateful set. And then the same, the, the, this deterministic storage also means that if you have like sector failures or 
you know, you need to recover parts of the state on one of the replicas, you know that the state on all the others is, is the same. So now you can do these, you can do much faster recovery because you've got smaller diffs between machines because you've got determinist, deterministic storage rather than everyone just haphazardly according to the thread scheduler, you know, writing to different places in disk. So all these benefits, you know, online verification, deterministic simulation testing, faster recovery, which you always want to optimize for. Um, fourth reason was that if we could do it ourselves, you know, we could really focus on memory. That's what we love. So we could go for, you know, maybe an order of magnitude, more efficient memory, less memory usage with static memory allocation. And lastly, um, you know, there's research like the, the Silk Papers, fantastic here on LSMs, but RocksDB and LevelDB, they've got these one second plus write stalls. Um, all of a sudden your client request is just gonna have a one or two second write stall. Um, that's just because of how compaction is not, is not always scheduled or not always incremental. So we wanted to totally eliminate compaction write stalls uh, completely. Um, we wanted a deterministic compaction schedule in our LSM tree for extremely tight bounds and latency. Um, the, the, this is something we're actively working on now. So if you take a look, you know, our storage engine is recently merged, um, but this is one of one of the things that you'll see PRs coming in for soon. Um, the design is all there and it's yeah, pretty, pretty interesting implementing this. Uh, so if you want to learn more about uh, Tiger Beetle storage engine, uh, you can also check out our 10 minute lightning talk at our Trad Boy. Uh, you can find it on our YouTube channel. Uh, this is the 10 minute version. Uh, there's a longer five hour video that you can also find there. Uh, and that one has, uh, it's complete with code walkthroughs some pair programming that Isaac and I did. Um, but another surprise about Tiger Beetle, I think, is that when it comes to network and disk, all our IO with the kernel is without syscalls. Uh, syscalls carry the cost of context switches, cache, cache misses. So instead, we use IO Uring to submit IO and receive IO completion. So disks and networks have become so fast these days that the cost of a switch is, context switch is about the same as the IO it submits. So you can halve throughput if you're not careful. Uh, it's also why we use a thread per core design. In the past, you had to be multi-threaded if you wanted async IO. These days, more efficient with IO Uring, get to use the kernel's thread pool. And I think that's the best part about IO Uring for me. Uh, now I have a first class async IO API on Linux. Uh, you unify all your networking disk IO. So shout out to Jens Expo for being awesome uh, because with IO Uring, it's definitely a good data database. So IO Uring is just one example of how to design for memory, given network and disk have become so fast. Another is the renewed focus on memory in the gaming industry, rise of data-oriented design for extreme uh, performance. Um, Andrew Kelly did a fantastic talk in Handmade Seattle Wait. last year on, Sorry, on this. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry. For the IO Uring, you're obviously using it for disk. Are you using the experimental one that writes for network, network buffers too, or no? Um, we use it for disk and for network. The network stuff was actually in, I think, from kernel 5.5 or 5.6. So oh, that's what like, we support. It's like, it's like a year ago. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, I, didn't yeah, realize, yeah. I didn't realize it in mine. All right. Thanks. Yeah, that, that's pretty good. And there's a ton of new stuff for network, all kinds of stuff like registered buffers. That's even been a, been a while, but the, then there's just the boatloads going into IRE, like more, more experimental stuff. But this, this, the basic networking disk has been there for, for some time. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so, yeah, but I think, you know, so you've got data which is designed for memory, uh, but from a safety perspective for memory, take this all the way, um, then the rule for static allocation of memory is common. Uh, it appears in most safety critical coding guidelines. Uh, that, again, like NASA's power of 10 rules of safety critical code. Um, you can see this, we've adopted it for Tiger Beetle's coding guideline. It's, you can read it in our repo, it's called Tiger Style. Um, and the reason for doing static allocation is simple. Um, if you force your code to live in a fixed pre-allocated area of memory, you get a deeper understanding of the domain. You're actually thinking about everything. You know, you're thinking about memory. Um, and this not only saves syscalls in the data plane, but makes it easier to verify memory use, protect against fragmentation uh, and detect deadlock. So the point is that there is a systems limit to all these things anyway. Uh, if you don't plan for them, then you're gonna pay for it in ops burden later, whereas static allocation makes capacity planning for the SRE easier since all limits are explicit. Um, yeah, and yeah, in other words, every kind of uh, resource usage in Tiger Beetle um, 
yeah, large or small, different sizes of duration, there's a fixed limit that's been pre-calculated. And I think it's just also important to understand what we mean by static allocation. So we don't mean in the sense of implementation, you know, as the C compiler would do it, you know, in the binary. Rather, it's just the system pr system's principle that all memory, indeed, or resource usage, it must be thought through, have a realistic limit. This limit should be known at compile time or at program startup, you know, if the command line user wants to give you you know, tell you how much RAM for the block cache, that's also fine. But when you're actually up and running at that point, there's a more dynamic memory allocation. Uh, that's how we see it. So for example, we do this, you know, for, it, this is not just a user land slab, right? We do this for everything in Tiger Beetle. So it's the memory for the messages for every possible permutation of the consensus protocol. You know, the, the way we've worked that all out uh, and it's pretty light, low footprint, you know, all the memory for structs, wireless entry compactions, everything um, is all statically allocated. And then we lay this all out, all the code and data types. Everything is laid out by hand, minimize padding, optimize for spatial locality and, you know, to reduce cache misses. Because um, generally, you know, the less memory you use, the less you thrash the cache, the faster you go. Uh, so, yeah, again, misconception, static allocation is wasteful. Uh, this I haven't seen this to be the case with Tiger Beetle. Our storage engine, it's not only static statically allocated, but it's extremely efficient. It's 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 pretty cool, like just to look at the code and see how efficient it is, you know. Um and it because it's a few hundred megs of RAM, um, you know, they can they're enough in memory to address, you know, excluding bloom filters and caching and all that stuff, but just the bookkeeping structures, that's enough to address more than 100 terabytes of storage. And that's a lot more than storage engines that do dynamic memory allocation. Uh, so I think it's just because we think about memory so much, uh, tend not to waste it. Uh, and once you have limits in place, you can then assert and test that these limits are not exceeded. So this is a force multiplier for fuzzing. Uh, what you don't limit, you can't test. What you do limit, you can. Um, so if you're fuzzing now, you can detect rare leaks that might otherwise have only been detected in production. Uh, so at this point on our tour, we're coming into land. We've looked at network disk memory. Uh, we come to the last part of our methodology, which is velocity. How do you develop a distributed database design in a tenth of the time? How do you get the courage you need to write a consensus protocol storage engine? Um, you know, it took Postgres almost 30 years to get to get some of this right. You know, so how do you how do you do this distributed in two years instead of ten? And the first part of the answer, at least you know, in terms of development velocity, I think is the velocity of anyone guess. How do you how do you optimize development velocity? You choose a language Dang. like like Zig. <laughs> Thanks, Annie. Good good guess. Uh, but yeah, so this is Zig, and I think we couldn't have done this so quickly without Zig. Uh, the tooling, type safety, compile time, code execution, compile time safety, and runtime safety of Zig is an order of magnitude better than C. I also believe that game development is a great litmus test for language. Um, and here, Zig's ecosystem is blossoming. blossoming. Uh, Zig has an incredible performance culture, a huge shared focus on memory, uh, no hidden allocations, uh, you can handle allocation failure safely. So out of memory is something we just have to handle, right? There's just no way we can panic. Um, Zig allows you to do that. Um, the explicit control of a memory layout and alignment that Zig gives you is just um, perfect for direct IO, much nicer than in C. And then you get this rich choice of allocators and test allocators. It's a whole ecosystem of allocators in Zig. It's a whole culture around different types of allocators. Um, so it seems like a risky bet, you know, pick a young language. Uh, remember again, Zig is really like a front end for LLVM, same as what Rust uses. Um, and in our experience, you know, we, we were watching Zig for two years before we made the decision. And the team are fantastic. The quality, it, things are early, but quality is really good. Uh, we also realized that our roadmaps would coincide in future in terms of stability. You know, we're going to take time. Tiger Beetle is going to take time to get to production. So will Zig. Um, and we wanted, you know, to invest for the next 30 years uh, rather than pay a language tax for the lifetime of Tiger Beetle. So I think Zig is the right language for the next 30 years. And, you know, give or take a year or two, that's fine. We'll, we'll go with Zig. Um, it's our only dependency. Uh, we're really happy with it, being a force multiplier for development velocity. 
Um, however, I guess, you know, most of the time that you put in, invest in a database, it goes into testing. Uh, it's the slow feedback cycle. So how do you amplify test velocity? For example, even with Jepson, as incredible as Jepson is, nevertheless, if you want to find a bug that takes three years to manifest, you still need to test for three years. Uh, if you find it, you might not be able to reproduce it on the next run because Jepson and most databases are not deterministic. So we literally ask the question, how, how can we speed up time? Uh, how can we find bugs and replay them uh, again and again as we switch on debug logs? And the answer uh, was inspired by Foundation DB, uh, the awesome simulation work they've done, as well as the work that James Cowling, CJ Jayakar, and others did at Dropbox. Don't know if you spotted, you know, James Cowling, Dropbox, he's also one of the authors of Eastern Replication. Uh, so that just sold it for us, right? Uh, but they did some incredible work on simulation testing at Dropbox. Uh, that, that was a big part of the inspiration. So we actually just, well, we said, well, let's literally speed up time. So we took the abstraction of the replicated state machine, networking, stable storage, even the clock source, and then you make them all deterministic. Uh, so you can shim the message passing and IO, and you can literally just tick time. You can run a whole cluster of Tiger Beetle replicas and clients, but in the same process as a pure simulation. So from a single 64-bit seed, whenever you want, you can just you know, drop this in Slack to share it with your team. Uh, the simulator can simulate a whole universe of network faults and latencies, just like Jepson. Uh, but it can also do storage fault injection and simulate storage latencies. And it can do this in a way that is protocol aware so that we can actually corrupt all replicas in the cluster at different you know, places in their log to test that Tiger Beetle runs smoothly. Uh, time in the simulator speeds up and be literally becomes a wild true loop. Uh, so we're literally just testing as fast as the CPU, you know, can take time. Uh, because the simulator also controls the world, has a state checker that can hook into all the replicas, check their state transitions, the instance they take place, um, and we use cryptographic hash chaining to prove causality and, and do all of this. Um, I think this is my favorite part about Tiger Beetle. Um, just that it's a deterministic distributed database. Um, in the first three weeks, we were able to find and fix 30 distributed systems bugs in our consensus. I think it's like averaging five a day, find and fix, find and fix. Um, and the simulator is also the reason that we felt confident to launch a bug bounty challenge called Viewstone Replication Made Famous. Um, and we pay out you know, up to $8,192 for correctness bugs in Tiger Beetle's consensus within the scope of the bounty. So we're now simulating Tiger Beetle's new storage engine. We have some performance regressions there that we're fixing, um, but things are looking pretty good and, and we, we're looking you know, towards our first production release next year. Uh, so the last thing I wanna show you is the business logic in Tiger Beetle as we come to the actual state machine. And this is really the last stop on our magical memory tour. Uh, it's important to understand uh, everything we've talked about in terms of network disk memory, static allocation and testing, it's all part of Tiger Beetle's VSR library. Um, one day, hopefully, you know, it's, it's gonna be an open source library. Uh, it's completely abstracted away from your business logic in the state machine. So we were intentional about this. When you're in the state machine, you don't see static allocation. Uh, this is thanks to Zig's comp time. So you get first class objects um, and you also get a really simple programming model where all the business logic is synchronous. For example, here's how Tiger Beetle processes a transfer between two accounts, you know, moving some money. Extremely simple to code business logic like this. You're protected by the consensus protocol and, you know, and Tiger Beetle that's all around you. Um, but your code in the state machine is, is like the simplest possible code. Uh, you know, once a batch of operations is in the log of a quorum of replicas, each replica can then execute it through its state machine function. You take the current state, apply the new operations, return the resulting state, goes into the storage engine. And again, here even, you know, we've taken care that we use fixed size cache line and line structs for all account and transfer data types. So processing a batch like this, there's no deserialization of mem copies. You literally, you've received from the kernel, you've got it in a buffer, and you, the state, the state machine logic is literally just iterating through it, um, no deserialization. So we require little Indian architectures, uh, and then you can do this. And Zig has got fantastic, you know, really fine grained casting and alignment in the type system for this. Um, so you might be wondering how we can make the biz logic synchronous, and the answer is that you know just before we commit to the state machine, we have a prefetch for a team 
Um, it looks through all the operations and ensures that all the data dependencies are prefetched or, you know, like page faulted asynchronously into the database cache. So ideally, it should appear as if the data is all in the memory already. The execution engine shouldn't have to worry about how data is fetched into memory, says Andy Pavlo. Uh, this means that by the time the business logic in the state machine gets to run, it's all completely synchronous and simple, nice, easy to reason about. Um, and again, you know, all the networking consensus, disk storage engine, static allocation, it, it's outside of the state machine. So state machine doesn't have to know about this. And so you see, we're learning from the professor here, I hope. Uh, yeah, finally, architecture of a replicated state machine, I think is just great for a distributed database. Uh, if you stick to it, if you keep all the complexity out of the state machine, um, then you can make your state machine generic and your database can become like a database framework, like kind of like a distributed systems Iron Man suit. So you can take Tiger Beetle's financial accounting state machine out and then you can put your own whole new state machine in um, and then you get like Redis or something, right? Uh, and you get all the benefit of Tiger Beetle, uh, but for your domain. So the late great uh, Fred Brooks, said that the programmer like the poet works only slightly removed from pure thought stuff he builds his castles in the air um, from air creating by exertion of the imagination few media of creation are so flexible so easy to polish and rework so readily capable of realizing grand conceptual structures and on behalf of the tiger beetle team i'd like to dedicate our talk to fred uh, and say that if there was ever a dream for a silver bullet, at least for databases, uh, then let it be the pure thought stuff and castles in the air of old powerful abstractions uh, and static allocation and new deterministic simulation testing. Uh, so we're excited for the future of these things and hope you'll join us for the journey as the road goes ever on. Hi, so awesome. I Applaud the head of everyone else. We're a little over time, so maybe one question from the audience. Is Victor still here? Victor has a question in the chat. All right, sorry, Gavin, do you have a question? Yeah, can can you hear me, Andy? Yes. Okay. Uh, first, thanks, uh, Jordan, for the the IO Uring library in Zig. Uh, it's fantastic to have that in standard. Um, I, I have a question about the architecture of your storage engine. So you mentioned that you have things set up where you sort of just do the receive into a buffer, right? And that's almost zero copy from the kernel. Um, do you have it set up where you're doing like fixed buffers or registered buffers in your page cache and you're registering those with IOU ring and you're just sort of sending those across? Yeah, thanks, Gavin. I loved your blog post on IE ring, so I'm glad you're using it, and that's awesome. So there, there is a copy from the kernel TCP receive buffer into our buffer in user space. That is a mem copy, mem copy, but from then on, no more. Um, we're not using registered buffers yet, though. So we could. That would that would make things more efficient. Um, we just got things up and running, and at the time when we started this, when we did that, you know, uh, IE ring into Zig standard lib registered buffers, I think were pretty new. So it, I, I wanted to just get it into the standard lib. So I kind of did the core of what you need for network and disk IO. And I didn't do a lot of, you know, the extra fancy stuff. I figured, you know, people will, and they have, you know, they've contributed that as open source since then. So yeah, it'd be pretty cool to use that in Tiger Beetle. Thanks. Got it. Thank you.